my spirit is dragging It's been sleeping in love I remember what it feels like when it's all paid When I wake it up Well, I, I was doing my research to talk to you and I realized that you had covered uh, a crowded house song, Don't Dream It's Over, a while ago. And as a coincidence, last night, uh, Neil Finn's studio is right around the corner from my place here. No and way! We there, I got invited to one of those listening things where it, they got a new crowded house album coming out in June, right? So I was no like, way. I, so I thought it was going to be one of these deals where you know you come in there and they play the record, you put some headphones on, everybody kind of looks, you know, trying to take notes and all that. But the way what they did was, we were in a studio about the size of my place here, and the band was set up to play. <gasps> And they were playing along with the record. So, oh my gosh! <laughs> so That's I'm like crazy. sitting. This, I'm sitting like this far away from Neil Finn. Mitchell Froom is directly behind me on an organ. That was just like blowing my mind. <laughs> that is such a cool idea! Wow. <laughs> so now, yeah. if I'm not mistaken, things are pretty different for y'all down there than they are for us here that is true well uh, speaking of crowded house uh, i just saw them in a show with twelve thousand other people at a big stadium thing like last week (sighs) yeah we're not we're not doing that i know that's that's not really on the in the in the cards for us unfortunately sad but true well hopefully you guys interact together (laughs) i'm happy that someone managed to figure out how to handle the situation well it's easier when you're on an island with only five million people as well so it helps, but we had I some think leadership also as some, well. Yeah, I had, some, I had some some other distinct advantages. It seems exactly. like exactly. <laughs> so, uh, well. so your record is out in like two days. Well, one day mm-hmm. here. Um, so, how are you feeling about it being released with all this stuff going on? You know, it's interesting because um, obviously, on one hand, I'm thrilled that it's I'm finally got kind of like seeing the process come full circle. Right. Um, right. It feels good, um, but it also is, it's always so much more fraught and strange and uncomfortable than I remember. Um, like I, and I, I forget every time, you know, I've put out so many records at this point and every time I have this, this moment where I'm expecting it to be as, you know, joyful and unencumbered as the original making of the thing. Right. And it's, it's never that good. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's good. It's just like, it's, um, it never does the thing you want it to do entirely. Like I've been joking around with my friends and you know, they, they just ran this nice feature on me in the New York times, which is obviously really nice and very flattering. And, um, and I've been texting my friends just like, yep, no more insecurity. And I'm just good. I'm good to go now. Uh, no more weird feelings and no problems from here on out. So a bed of roses, huh? <laughs> yeah, it's it's just sort of like it's kind of a classic wherever you go, there you are situation, you know? Right, right, right. right. Um, and so it's it's like it's always a, a little bit more complicated uh, feelings wise than I than I expect it to be. And then I'm like, oh, right. It's it's uncomfortable to be looked at. <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I can see that it could be the case. But, but uh, you're not doing you can't do any live gigs. So. That's sure one thing you're not going to be looked at there. I'm not going to be looked at there. I mean, I do in some ways, I, I actually am putting together, working on putting together a live stream right. with, uh, with a full band, which is fun. I've, I've done a lot of filming of myself playing these songs by myself, right? Um, which is, you know, it's obviously fun to play music in any capacity, but I sat down with my guitar player the other day and it was amazing how instantly I was just like, oh God, even playing music with one other person is so much more fun and joyful right. than it is yeah. to do it by yourself. So I, I do think that there will be some really nice, fun moments. Oh, very uh, good. Very good. And you've been pretty prolific. I mean, you put out a couple of EPs, uh, both as Flock of Dimes and Why Oak uh, last year. And mm-hmm. now you've got this this full length record out uh, this week. Um, is, are you more prolific than you have been because of lockdown and all that? Or is that just the way you are? I mean, I think that... Um, I think I'm the same amount of prolific, but I think this year I just had a lot more time. Right. Um, you know, usually I'm having to juggle being on tour with everything else in my life with writing. And although I, I tend to, you know, left to my own devices, I tend to try to make a daily writing practice a priority as much as I can. Um, but it's not always possible when I'm traveling. So mm. I think I'm the same me, but I just, 
I, all of that stuff got taken away and I, the schedule got wiped clean and the slate was, <laughs> was wide open. And so I just, um, and it's funny because a lot of people are just like, how did you manage to work so hard during the pandemic? And I'm like, I really didn't work. I actually worked way less hard than I'm used to. Right. I just right. had more time. Like right, I, right. I wasn't, I wasn't like, it wasn't like every day I was sitting at, at, you know, my studio desk self-flagellating until I wrote a song. It was like, I just had, I had a lot of space in my life. And so I right. was able to, to make more things. Very cool. Now, when you're sitting there writing at your desk like that, are you, when you're writing, do you have in mind what you're writing for, or do you just write and then figure out where it goes next? It's more, yeah, it's, I very rarely have in mind what it's for while it, I'm working on it, because I feel like that's a really easy way to psych yourself out. Right. Um, any, any amount, uh, uh, excessive amount of like, um, front brain thinking can kind of get in the way when you're in that sort of more intuitive flow right. zone. Mm -hmm. So I tend to do a lot of like, let's just get it, get it down pen to paper. And then after the fact, once I have some perspective, it usually is clear where it would fit or what it makes sense for. Right, right, right. Now, so the new album is called Head of Roses. And from what I've read from the promo stuff I've got, it's a record about heartbreak, which is, I'm sorry to say. This. Thanks. Yeah, it happens to the best of us. What can I say? <laughs> That's true. <Yeah. laughs> um, so um, the record, I assume, was recorded kind of early on in lockdown when all that stuff was happening. So how much did that environment have an effect on what we hear at the, the end of this record? You know, I think a lot of, uh, I think about heartbreak, the specific heartbreak that I was experiencing at the beginning of this pandemic. Um, as sort of like the the spark that lit the match that went on to like burn it all to the ground as it were you know right. because I, when i started writing a lot of these songs in a very condensed period of time i was it was really sort of the process of just like trying to soothe myself and comfort myself and find some sort of sense of healing and peace and understanding of a difficult situation um but the layers sort of uh began to unfold and as as it, as the process deepened, it became clear pretty quickly that a lot of what I was feeling was about a lot more than just this one specific situation, like this right. one specific heartbreak situation. And I think that what what became clear around that was that I had spent a lot of my life, um, I think like a lot of people do, um, throwing themselves into distractions, uh, whether those distractions are, you know, a certain amount of constant work or constant busyness or, um, or losing yourself in other people or relationships right. um, as a means of distracting myself from feeling my more uncomfortable feelings and sitting with some more painful truths about myself and mm -hmm. my life. And so to me, although the cat, the heartbreak was of course the catalyst and that, that in combination with the pandemic and the timing of it sort of leading me in a situation where I had no choice, but to sit with myself and no choice, but to really like look at some of this stuff um, was the beginning of me pulling a thread that led to something, I think a little bit bigger. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and that was, that was sort of the record making process in a nutshell. And yeah, as far as the making of the thing, I wrote it very quickly because like I said, I was, I was devastated and had a lot of time on my hands. So what else are you going to do? Right. And, um, right. and I was fortunate enough that I, um, I'm just a few minutes away from the recording studio where I made the thing. Um, uh. it's a short 10 minute drive from my house into the country, um, and my friends, Nick and Amelia, uh, built it out there. Um, it was finished the day before. I mean, like, we truly, like, they, they finished construction on it. And the next day we went in and started working on my record. So I was the first person to get to work in there. <laughs> um, cool. But if, yeah, it was amazing. But, like, if that space wasn't available to me, I'm not sure that the record would have been made at you know, the way that it was because it allowed us our proximity to that space and to each other allowed us to do it safely in a, a way that I think would have been very challenging in other circumstances. Right. Now, from what I understand, most of the songs that are on the album were written relatively recently, except for the opening track, which is called Two Heads, which mm -hmm. is, reaches back about five years or so. How can I explain Inside my mouth For eyes crying Eyes lay left And both Will waste away by half It's what, what, 
what did you save that one for? <laughs> That's now. a great question. I, you know, <laughs> it's funny because it, when people started asking me that question, I had to, I realized I had to figure that out. And um, fortunately, there's a reason behind, I, I, I've learned to trust my intuition because a lot of these decisions are made intuitively. And then I go back and I'm like, oh yeah, that actually does make sense. And so <laughs> when you think about this record being um, about the duality of, of heartbreak or right. the dual, like duality in, in general, which meaning like in this, the situation that inspired it was that I had left a relationship to start another one that that ended. So on one hand, I was, I was in pain as a result right. of, someone else, but I was also well aware that I was the source of that same pain for another person that I cared about very much. So you have to sort of hold those things at once and you can't tell these stories about, um, I'm the victim or I'm, you know, they're the, um, they're some kind of monster because I want to protect myself and I want to feel better about myself. So it's like a, a matter of like acknowledging things that are uncomfortable and painful that you might not feel super um, comfortable like learning or accepting about yourself. Um, and then on a broader scale, it's about the sort of the ways in which we hide from ourselves generally. And that the way that that avoidance of painful truths um, can sort of end up causing more pain for ourselves and others. And that sort of like learning to acknowledge it and see it and integrate it is the only way that it doesn't then become a force of like unconscious control in your life. Right. Um, <clears throat> which is sort of the, the spiral that I was on without even realizing it. Mm-hmm. And so that's the context that I need to give you to tell, to answer your question about two heads, which is that <laughs> I wrote that song. Um, and that song is, is sort of about uh, self-sabotage right. <laughs> and, and survivor's guilt. And it, it sort of is, uh, it's about a different subject entirely. It's about sort of like what it was like to grow up in a somewhat traumatic uh, environment and it's about how making the choice to to move on from that and to grow beyond it also amount uh, involves a certain amount of loss and grief because you're you know you're like having to sort of like create the separation between you and people you care about right. and so that song was I the way that I see it writing two heads was sort of the very beginning of me kind of pulling the thread of a, of this larger picture that I later came to understand through making head of roses and going through everything that I went through when I was making that record, Uh but it was in a different realm of my life. Like it was in a sort of like, it was in that initial like core developmental zone. Right. And, And I hadn't yet put the pieces together that they're all connected. (laughs) Turns out, you know, who knew? Who knew? (laughs) Yeah. Bummer. But, you know. uh, Now, you mentioned that you're not particularly keen on uh, your photographs and your image being used. But there's a beautiful video uh, for the hard way which uh, you, the lighting and the, it's kind of almost psychedelic and the song itself is pretty cool as well. Very, very intimate song. So I was wondering what kind of, how much do you have to do with the making of those videos and with that one in particular? If I lost your hand, I know I could stand without your protection. Because I know doesn't mean I will. It would be the hard way. Everything really. I mean, I didn't. I, um, you know, I think something that it, that happens when you are a uh, mid-level artist such as myself, <laughs> working with a limited budget. Uh, right. Um, it, it involves a certain amount of, uh, a DIY spirit. Uh, now I, for that video, I worked with a very, very amazing artist. His name is Lachlan Turkson. And he, um, we had actually connected. I had had a different idea that I wanted to try and execute that, um, ended up being a little bit too complicated and expensive. Right. And so we sort of like zeroed in and he initially came up with the idea for the projection mapping of um, lights. Yep. And then we sort of zeroed in on 
that together. Um, but all the videos, I mean, it's like, I think I love being able to delegate to people who know better and are much more comfortable in those um, mediums than I am because it's not my forte at all but I also have some very specific ideas about like how I want to look and how I want to be seen and what I'm comfortable with and what I'm not and like just basically creating like a world for things so right. even though it's not an area that I feel personally very um, fluent in I I always want to weigh in you know I don't want it I can't just leave it up to chance okay and you know there's also a video for um, P price of blue which uh, the video is cool, but I wanted to talk to you maybe about your guitar playing on that one as well. Tell me about you and your guitar. I will. Um, that song, um, one of the reasons why I wanted, specifically wanted to play that guitar part and the guitar solo, even though my friend Meg, who's in many ways just objectively a far superior player than I, um, they were there, but but I, I felt like it was important to play that part um, because one of the things that I wanted to capture in that song was the sense of anger. Right. Um, it yeah. was written at a stage of the grieving process where I was still very much in an anger phase, which is a part that I sort of move through. I tend to move through somewhat quickly. Um, but there is, uh, I'm learning a lot about how important it is to sort of like learn how to sit with my own anger and feel it and not try and belittle it or like repress it. And so I really wanted something that sounded enraged and kind of unhinged in that song uh -huh. and in that case it's not really about the like uh, the fluency of the playing it's more about the spirit of it um and uh so yeah i think that was why i made the choice generally with guitar i feel like i love the guitar and i feel like i also feel sometimes a little bit confused mm -hmm. at the attachment that people have to it Right. As because it's a tool, you know, like to me, I'm just sort of like, it's often the right tool for the job. Right. <laughs> like sometimes it's not. And right, right. that's cool. And so like, I really don't. Um, it's one of, you know, it's obviously one of the instruments that I'm that I'm drawn to more often than not, because it's so malleable. I mean, you can change the I change tunings a lot because right. so it provides you this sort of like way of um, having a different relationship to the instrument. Um, which a lot of instruments really don't do or, or don't allow for. Um, and so I have a, I have a very, I would say it's like, it's very near and dear to my heart. I think I, my feelings around it are just tend to get a little bit confused and muddled when right. <laughs> um, people seem to fixate on, on the tool over what well, the tool Well, it, I think it might be a generational <laughs> thing as well. I'm an older guy and, you oh. know, I grew up listening to Jimi Hendrix and mm -hmm. the, you know, all those guys and mm -hmm. not so many girls. And, you know, the guitar yeah. was the thing, you know, and it's like, oh, yeah. my God, look at that guy. We bow yeah. down to it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Guitar gods that, or whatever. Whereas yeah. I, I can't ever remember having a similar situation or conversation about a synth player. <laughs> yeah. <know? laughs> yeah. And that, why is that? That's so strange, right? Yeah. It's like. Yeah. I, I don't quite understand the myth making around it as, and maybe it is a generational thing. I, I think it might be, <laughs> but it's, you know, it's like, I do. I also love playing guitar and it's so much fun, but right. I love playing so many things. And it's like, there, there are a lot of instruments that are also really physical, like drums or some, you know, so it's like, I wonder why we like gravitate toward it yeah. so much in that way. And you don't have the same kind of myth making around like, yeah, like you said, like synthesizers or something. <laughs> I don't know. It's weird. Uh, I, now, the 10 songs that comprise the album, how much uh, thought did you put into what order those songs? Do they tell a little story from beginning to end, do you think? Probably think too much do. thought. <laughs> yeah, I think they do too. I'm glad you do. I'm glad you think they do because, yes, I put a lot of thought into that. Um, there's an arc to it for sure. And it's, and it's not about – I mean, it's, of course, about – on one hand, it's about how the songs sound – together and how they flow but there's also like a story behind it right. and I had alluded to the fact that Price of Blue 
you know, which is the second track on the record, um, captures that sort of like like stages of grief kind of yeah. thing. Um, and anger's early in the, in the process, yep. as you may recall. Um, and so um, I like to think that the record starts out in a sort of more um, confused and questioning place and eventually works its way towards some sense of like forgiveness and peace and understanding. Yep. Yep. Um, that's, that's the arc that I was trying to suggest with it. So, so on songs like No Question and uh, Head of Roses, which kind of near the end of the album, those vocals seem very intimate and very personal. So what kind of environment do you create for yourself to be able to sing like that? Is it uh, everybody gone? Are you by yourself? Uh, is it dark? Often, <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it depends. In the, in the actual recording of what made it onto the record, you know, it'd be it'd be interesting to go back and listen to the demos because I'm I'm the kind of person that I'm recording demos of the songs as I'm writing them. Right. And for a song like No Question, I I made the whole track in my room in my little home studio, um, and it had actually been. You know, I was I was trying to find a way to like soothe, like to literally soothe my nervous system, like calm my like body. And right. singing, you know, is all about breath. It's all about the breath, and and it's like it can be a very very calming thing. And so I I made this this sort of like soundscape, and the idea being that if I maybe I would just want to do these like long held extended notes, because it felt so soothing and calming and comforting to sing in that way. And that's why I think that song is written in the way it is. It's got all these long held notes. Um, yeah. It's like literally an attempt to like breathe and calm my nervous system. Um, and then, you know, Head of Roses, I also like, I, I would be curious to hear the demo because I remember it, it feeling like I was very fragile. I was in a very fragile place. Sure. But then it's, it's a different thing entirely taking those, those literal first performances of the song that you do the first thing you do after you write it and then trying to capture that spirit and that energy again for the recording is like it's always challenging i'm someone who in the past i've recorded my own vocals a lot because i'm such a control freak and because i'm a little intimidated and a little nervous to be around other people because it is very yeah. vulnerable yeah but in this case i was with um nick my co-producer and bella our engineer and Fortunately for me, um, they are both exceptionally good at making, uh, creating a very comfortable and accepting feeling space. Right. Um, so I felt safe enough around them to track, you know, in a way that I maybe would have a harder time with other folks getting into that like headspace that I needed yeah. to be in. Because I can just imagine you, the last thing you want is to be in that headspace and then some engineer slamming it crying screaming in yeah, your headphones Wait yeah, that one yeah. more time I'm mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah bella and i in particular bella's amazing she's an incredible incredible engineer and mixer she mixed a lot of the songs in the record too and um she um she's just um she's got such an incredible gentleness about the way she does things like she's very uh, unass unassuming and like um I don't know. It's just like, she's got a very calming energy and we had a really good workflow going. Like I, I noticed very early on that she's got a very, very good ear and she can hear um, discrepancies in vocals as well as I can, which right. I often feel, I don't think that a lot of people, not to be like, Oh, I'm so great. But like, right. I, it's not a skill that every musician even has. Cause it's like in many ways specific to singers. And once I realized that she could hear a lot of the same things that I could, in the same way, I started being able to trust her. And right, so we right. had like a, a good, a kind of a really good working relationship. In that and way. I guess that if you know that you have someone else who's listening the same way, it frees you to not have to think about that when you're, because you have somebody else looking out for you. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And it, it frees your brain up and you learn that you can rely on someone other than your own. Because it's hard to have perspective about your own voice, you know, it's yeah. like, oh, sure. it's really hard. So to have someone that you trust, be able to wait. And, 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 and Nick too, like I really, he's actually incredible at producing vocals. Um, he's done that so much with Amelia, his partner in Sylvanesso. So, you know, he's got a, I, it was nice to have people that I trusted to be able to weigh in when I started to lose perspective on myself. Right. Now we were talking about no question and head of roses. The, there's a song in between those two at the near the end of the album called "Awake for the Sunrise," yeah. and 
So you're kind of more peaceful and forgiving on those songs, but you're kind of beating yourself up, it seems like, on that track. I gave up on that life as I gave myself to you. And I deserve it the very worst of you. I deserve it, I know I do. <laughs> <laughs> so there's obviously stuff that needs to be resolved. Is it? Yeah, no kidding. Um, it's funny because I think uh, this is a, it's funny because like the, the journey doesn't end when the record's written, right, you know? Sure. So like, um, and when I wrote Wake for the Sunrise, I wasn't a very, you know, that I deserve it line. Yeah. Um, hits, hits, hits me hard now because it's, um, I think there was, it was an, an, an attempt to, to take responsibility, to ex to like accept the parts that were mine, to, right. to take responsibility for. What I think I hadn't really reconciled at that time was um, was being able to do that with self compassion, instead of just being like, oh well, I'm evil and bad, so clearly I deserve what I get. Like, yeah. um, I think that everyone. In, in most situations, particularly when, you know, the super complex world of human relationships are involved, it's like people are doing their best and they're sometimes dealing with, um, with baggage and with, with, with turmoil and with trauma that they're not even entirely fully aware of or in control of. Yeah. And it, it's, it's, I'm the kind of person where sometimes I think it's easier for me to be understanding and forgiving of someone else than it is for myself. And that's really like the, I think the next step, like that's the, the next frontier for me. It's like, it's one thing to be like, you know, yeah, I, maybe I, some of my behavior wasn't what I would have hoped for or expected, but like, I'm also a human being and I deserve forgiveness as much right. as anyone else does, you yeah. know? And let's face it, this past year has been strange and weird and kind of stressful for almost everyone so it hasn't exactly been an easy one no it's true so how, how are you feeling about 2021 oh gosh 2021 is great so far Good. um <laughs> my life is still relatively pretty much the same except um the tiniest things like the tiniest little changes to my routine feel like the craziest thing that's ever happened. Right, to me. right, right. Yeah. You know, my brain is still calibrated to just really not need very much to get through the day anymore. You know, my life used to be so big. You know, it was like I I literally, you know, the last thing I did was before pandemic was go to Asia with Bonnie Bear and play in arenas. You know, right. I was used to like this like everything was so big. There's so much. Um and like it it's very small now, um, but but it was interesting to discover that, like I think for a while I made the mistake of thinking that um, the my emotional landscape was was directly proportional to, like like I could be if I if I had a bigger crazier wilder life I would be happier, um, or I would feel more, but now I'm at this point where. I feel the same amount of happy when I like cook myself a nice dinner as I used yeah. to feel when I was on stage playing to thousands of people. Right. And, like the emotional, the experience of it inside my body is the same. And it's, it's very freeing in a way to realize that you don't actually need the kind of, of like stimuli that you thought you did to get to that place. Like you can just sort of be satisfied with, fewer and fewer and simpler and simpler things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, but I still get the feeling that you're, you like to change up and experiment with yeah, music. And yeah. so have you had enough time, have time to think about what you want to do next and what kind of direction you want to head in and what you want to yes, do in well, general? Well, Andy, my bandmate in Wyoke and I are working on music uh, already. And right. We have a couple of new songs that I think we'll be hopefully be able to share soon. Cool. Um, so that's kind of, I'm in that world as we speak. And um, I do want to start writing again and I'm excited about that, but I really want to make something that's fun to play. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
like not that these songs aren't but they're very sad and they're yeah. very they're very like i want to make something that's a little bit lighter and more unburdened and sure. more like just enjoyable to like because the thing that i miss like you can always sit at home and play guitar in your house and sing songs the thing that i miss is the interplay mm. um between musicians and so i i really want to make some music that's like that's got some of that energy right right well hopefully you'll be in front of folks singing and playing very soon it Fingers seems to be crossed. opening up a bit over there, I guess. I don't it's know. getting there. I mean, I got my first vaccine shot a couple of weeks ago, which is very exciting. Yep. yep. Um, and you're I'll still living, to... so that's good. Yeah, I'm still here. <laughs> I feel great. I feel A, a plus, super healthy. I'll be able to see my parents, you know, hopefully, yeah. and um, get out in the world, maybe get my hair cut, you know. <laughs> right. um, Little, little things. I'm yep, just, yep, yeah. yep. Okay. And come down to New Zealand if you get a chance. We'd love to have you. I don't know if you're ready to have, I don't know if you'll let me in at this point, but. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, even if you do get in, you have to sit in isolation for two weeks at this point. Yeah. But they're when working I, when on I'm, trying to open up with Australia and it's, yeah. you know, there's a lot of fluffing around. When it's, nervous. I don't, I don't want to screw up what you guys got going on, but as soon as it's, <laughs> as soon as it's safe, I would be all about it. All for it. Yeah. Well, thank, well, that's great. So hopefully things go well on your release day. Uh, thank you. Have a great day for that. And, you know. Thank you. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. I really appreciate it. Thanks yeah. for asking such great questions and um, enjoy the rest of your day. And thanks for saying nice things about the record too. Really <laughs> that was easy. All right. Thanks. <laughs> thank thank you, you very much. Have a great have day. Have a great one. Take Bye-bye. care. Bye-bye.